Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, people up the back, can you hear me okay? Everything's good. If at any point I'm too quiet, just sort of yell, ah, oh, be louder. It will be good. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to Comp 1511, uh, 18S1, Programming Fundamentals. So, if you're not here for this course, uh, stick around and you'll hopefully learn something or, you know, go to your actual classes. So, how's that font size? Good font size, people up the back? No? Yes? They can't even see me. Cool. So, this is our first lecture, as I'm sure you will know, and we're just going to go through an introduction to the course, sort of talk a bit about the bigger picture side of programming in the course, and then look at a little bit of actual programming. So, before we start out, how many of you have got some programming experience? So you've written some code before? Okay, so maybe about half. People with your hands up. What is programming? What do you think programming is? Someone? Yeah? Instructions to tell a computer to do something? Yep, that's one way of looking at programming. Anyone else? How else could you describe programming? What else is programming? I heard two things at once. The thing what programmers do and making your life easier. Yes, I, I like both of those answers as well. Yeah, language and communication, that's a very good point. Because when you're programming, you've got to communicate your thoughts to the computer such that it can understand you. Problem solving. Problem solving, yes, all these good answers. Um, any other thoughts? Spending your life debugging. So those of you who haven't learned any programming yet will soon come to appreciate that programming, things break all the time, and it's really hard to work out why. It's great. We, we like programming. Any other thoughts? Logic. Logic? Yep, another good answer. Although it's very logical and it's also very creative, which often you think may not be hand in hand, but um, you will discover it. So we, you're going to learn C programming in this course, so programming in the language called C, but programming like you said, it's sort of you know, telling a computer how to do something, having logical instructions. And we can have programming in ways that like, isn't even a language like C. And so I have this YouTube video that I hope is going to work. Ah, we're going to do no, ads. Can I like, preemptively skip the ads? Yeah, there we go. Okay. You're not making any sense. Sorry, you ruined it on purpose. He knows how to make one. What's up, the internet? You know what? I'm hungry. I could really go for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay. Do you guys think you can write down some instructions and teach me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yeah. Then do it. I knew we were going to do this. I heard Dad talking to Mom. <laughs> Choke yourself on my hand. Sometimes they do when you tell them. <laughs> Step one, get two pieces of bread out. Got them. Get a butter knife and get some PB. Take one piece of bread, spread it around with the butter knife. No, Dad, with the peanut butter. I'm just doing what it says. It says, take one piece of bread, spread it around with the, bu with the butter knife. Hold on. Get some jelly, rub it on the other half of the bread. Jelly. It doesn't say to do that. Put the breads together on top of each other. Take a big bite. <laughs> this doesn't taste like a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Ah, <laughs> ah, oh, ah. Mm. Sorry, I had to. I had to make it extremely specific. Oh, good. I'm starving. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. 
Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop a bit of peanut butter out a bit, of the- A bit, that means like a lot. A bit means a lot? In my world. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto one of your pieces of bread with the knife. All right? There we go. Doing better than before though. Open the jelly jar. Squeeze it onto the other piece of bread. No. Done. Closer. Get two pieces of bread. Get some peanut butter. Take the peanut butter knife. Open the peanut butter. Put the knife in the PB. Get some jelly. Open the jelly. No. Squirt the jelly onto the bread. Take the butter knife with the peanut butter on it. Wipe it all over the piece of bread that's blank. Take the butter knife, rub the jelly all over the piece of bread. Oh, you're doing better. Oh. It's all over. Put the two pieces on top of each other. This is how I meant. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop some of the peanut butter out of the inside of the jar. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto one of your pieces of bread with the knife. No! Squeeze some jelly onto the other piece of bread. Spread the jelly on the bread with the butter knife. Put your two pieces of bread, peanut butter and jelly sides together. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Get two pieces of bread. Get some peanut butter. Get some jelly. In the peanut butter. Get a butter knife. Put the butter knife in the peanut butter. Take the butter knife. <laughs> Take one piece of bread and take the butter knife that has the peanut butter on it, spread it all over the top of the piece of bread. That's the top. I mean the sides. Squirt some on another piece of bread. Take the butter knife, rub it all over the top of the piece of bread. I quit. You know I ain't making any sense. Sorry you ruined it on purpose. He knows how to make one. <laughs> Do you know how to eat a piece of bread? <laughs> you want to take your sandwich with you? Oh, this is so good. It looks like a yummy sandwich. I'm glad I made that for you. Can I have one more with it? Yeah, go take that one to mommy. I edited a bit. Take two pieces of white bread. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop some of the peanut butter out of the inside of the jar. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto the face of one of your pieces of bread with the knife. Squeeze some jelly onto the other piece of bread. Spread the jelly on the bread with the butter knife. Put your two pieces of bread, peanut butter and jelly sides together. Done. Now eat it. Not the best. Well, you made it. But so I, I think it qualifies. And that's a win. Woohoo! <laughs> well, Evan and John, did that go as you expected? <laughs> yes. I expected to win. Well, you sort of won. But really, I feel like we were all losers. Did you guys have fun at all? Yeah. There were, there were at least a few points where it seemed like Evan was kind of having fun. He's like... I don't know nothing. <laughs> So
So that might seem like a bit of like a silly, unrelated video, right? But it's computing, programming is a lot like that. You can't just tell the computer, hey, please make me a sandwich. You've got to kind of tell it, okay, the first step is through this, get the bread out, you know, spread this off with a knife and so on. Like you have to break it down very precisely, step by step, exactly what you mean each time in order for the computer to understand you. So why is programming awesome? I hope that by the end of the course, all of you will think that programming is really awesome. Um, those of you who already know programming, how many of you think it's awesome? Let's try the other question. How many of you who know programming don't think it's awesome? There's like one or two hands. It's pretty good, pretty good. So why, why is programming awesome, right? I've got my ideas, but I want to hear from you guys. People have programmed before. Why is programming awesome? It lets you be creative without having to, yeah. Um, no, no, that's a really good point. Like, you can be creative with programming. Like, so I know in high school you do like art class and you get to be creative in art class. And some of you, like me, probably are really bad at painting and sculpture. But programming, we can be creative in our own way without needing to be able to do art things. And just with a computer, you can do so much. You'll hopefully see in the second assignment a really good example of that. Yeah, that's a good thought. Any other ideas? It makes sense. What do you mean by that? Like, a lot of the time, if you tell your children that you're doing sport or working in a team or something, you might fail and you don't know why. Whereas with programming, like, if you do everything right, step by step, it happens the way you want it to. That's, that's a very good answer. So, to repeat that if you didn't hear at the back, it's. With programming, unlike with things like sport, where if you fail, you might not know why, with programming, you always know exactly what you've done wrong. Like, if something doesn't work in your code, it's because something is wrong in your code, and you can work out what it is. Good thought. Any others? Yeah? You can do really complex things really easily, yes. It's very true. Any other thoughts? You can automate the boring bits. Yes, you definitely can. If you Imagine, you know, as a human, you were trying to add together two very large numbers. You could do that, right? You can get a pen and paper and add the numbers by hand. A computer can do that in, like, less than a second. So computers are very, very good at doing certain things very, very fast. Did you have a thought as well? You can experiment without blowing things up. That is a very good point and similar to one that I'm going to say. Are there any last thoughts? Yeah? You can make money with it. That's very true. I'd like to hope that you're here because you enjoy computing or because you think you might enjoy computing and not just because you want to make money. But there is certainly a lot of money to be made in computing. Um, but coming back to that point of you can experiment without blowing things up. So one of the things I love about computing, like in other forms of engineering, civil engineering, I think, where they build bridges. You, know, you can design your bridge, you can work out the schematic and all that sort of thing. That's fairly straightforward, but then building the bridge takes lots and lots of people and a long time and a lot of effort. Whereas with programming, we do sort of the same amount of effort to design our program, but then we can just run our program. We don't have to go out and physically build a bridge. So we can do a lot of very powerful things very easily. Um, so I think that's similar to what you were saying. And we can solve problems and we can help people. Like, how many of you have used Google Maps before? How many of you remember a time before Google Maps where you had to use paper maps? Yeah, the, the one old guy who raised his hand. <laughs> so something like Google Maps, right? A, a large group of people have collaborated, worked together. They've made this thing where anyone with a, a phone or an internet connection can view a map of where they are and get directions and all that sort of thing. And I mean, how many people has that helped? How many hours has that saved? It's, probably a lot. So I think programming is awesome. That's why I'm here, to try and tell you that I think it's awesome and try and make you feel like it's awesome as well by the end of the course. So this is a course where you'll learn to program. Um, hopefully, that's what you came here looking for. At the end, you'll be able to write programs. But not just that, you'll become a confident programmer. You'll feel like you can you know, make the programs that you want to in the ways you want to. 
And you won't just be writing code, but you'll hopefully be writing code that you're proud of. So rather than just going, oh, I've made this program that works. Like, I'm sure a lot of you have done self-taught programming. You've just focused on making things work. And you often haven't thought about the process behind it or how you can make the code be good code that you're proud of. So that's a thing that I hope you will get to learn as well. And to discover the joys of programming. Like, people with programming experience, is programming awesome and fun? Yes. How many of you think, OK, no one thinks programming is awesome and fun? I hope by the end you will, you will all find it fun. See, one of the tutors up the front would respond, but he's too busy programming. So it can be tricky at first. Like when you, when you start out learning anything, it can be hard. And with programming, when you start out with writing a program, it can be hard. The code won't compile. You know what that means by the end of the lecture. You don't know what's going on. You can sort of go, ah, oh, what's my, I don't know what I'm trying to do. And you sort of go, my code works. It's good enough. You know, it runs, prints out what it's supposed to print. That's good enough. I'm going to leave and go home. But is that good enough? Like, it's easy to lose sight when you're sort of lost in this haze of trying to get things to work and not being able to get it to work. And it's easy to sort of lose sight of what you're really trying to do, which is to make a good program, hopefully. Um, so in terms of who's teaching this course, we have three lecture streams. There are, I think, 1,149 students in this course. That's a very large number, and that's the biggest this course has ever been. So we need to actually have three lecturers in three lecture rooms to fit you all. So I am Andrew Bennett. We also have Andrew Taylor in CLB somewhere. Um, and also Dr. John Shepard in Matthew's something else in that direction. So we're the lecturers, for each of the lecture streams. Uh, the course convener is Andrew Taylor. So if you have a problem with the course, he's the person to sort it out. Like He's the one in charge of the course, effectively. Um, the course administrator is Mei Cheng, who's a fantastic person, works behind the scenes, makes everything work. Um, and normally, I have a list of the tutors and lab assistants, but that would take up the entire slide. And then some, we have a lot of tutors and lab assistants. They're all fantastic people. And I'm sure you will get to know them. Um, in terms of who's learning, you are. So how many of you are in your first semester of university? That is way more than I'd expected. That's like half. Okay. The reason I'm surprised is that all of the new students were meant to be enrolled in Lecture Stream A. But clearly, Lecture Stream A was so full that we also have another half a room of new students. That's cool. That's, that's really cool. Um, I had other things I was going to ask. No, I don't. So about half of you are uh, in your first semester of uni. How many of you are like straight out of high school? So you were in high school last year, and now you're here. That's cool. That's very cool. Welcome to university. Uh, university is a fantastic, amazing place. I don't know what you thought about high school, but I didn't really like high school. I sort of just something you had to get through and you know, racing to the end, and then, oh, cool, I'm done. I can leave high school, go to uni. But uni is fantastic. I have enjoyed myself so much here that I haven't left. Um, and if you stay for long enough, they make you lecture. So you might want to graduate eventually. But no, I thoroughly have enjoyed uni so much. Um, you have so much more freedom than in high school. You can effectively do what you want um, in the sense that if you don't turn up to the lecture, I'm not going to like have a role and say you didn't come and call you. You should still go to lectures. You should do, you know, you have the choice to not go to lectures, but you should still go to them. You should kind of develop the discipline, I guess, to come along to lectures and go to classes. But there's a lot more freedom. There's a lot more flexibility. You get to learn more cool things. You don't have to take English. It's a thing I didn't really like about high school. So how many of you are doing a computing degree? So computer science, software engineering, bioinformatics. How many of you aren't doing a computing degree? Uh, what degree are you doing? How many of you are doing data science? Because that's also another computing-ish degree. Cool. That's quite a few people. I think that's a new degree as of last year, so I hope it's a good degree. How many of you are not computing or data science students? Yeah, what degree are you doing? Electrical engineering, cool. Someone else who's not doing electrical engineering? Yeah? Mechatronics, cool. Do we have anyone who's not doing an engineering of any kind here? Advanced maths, cool. 
Anyone else who's not? Yeah? Economics. Economics, cool. Anyone else who's doing a non-computing degree? Did someone say something? I don't know, yeah, okay. Um, so I mean, there's a, there's a wide variety of students here. I, we'll get to that in a minute. So yeah, I think it's cool that there's such a wide range of students here. Some of you have programmed before, some of you haven't. Some of you are doing computing degrees, some of you haven't, some of you aren't. Even if you're not doing a computing degree, I hope that you'll get a lot out of this course. Um, learning to program is pretty fun. I'm going to skip to this slide for a second. So one of the things I was told definitely mentioned today is discussing whether you should take Comp 1511. So if you are a CSE major um, doing, I think, mechatronics, some streams, or data science, you have to take this course. It's a requirement for your degree. If you are doing electrical engineering, I believe you can choose this or Comp 1911. You are very welcome to take this course if you want to. Um, it's more challenging than Comp 1911, so even though the course number is lower, it's a more challenging course. We cover more content. So if you want to take a challenging course and you want to learn more programming and you even know you love programming or you think you might love programming, then by all means, you're very welcome to stay in this course. If you only enrolled because you thought it was easier than Comp 1911, you're able to switch to Comp 1911 if you want to. The student office can help you with that. Um, what a good question. So the question was, where is the student office? So in the computer science building, which is called K17, is a grid reference K17, in the ground floor foyer, there's the student office, who are the people who can help you with enrollment and things. You can also email them, find them online. So if you, have, if you want to change enrollment, I believe this week you can by yourself. I believe from next week onwards, they might have to do it for you. They might have to help you out. Oh yes, that's what I was saying. So, and if you're doing, if you're another engineering student or you're doing this, doing this as an elective, then you don't have to take this course. If it's an elective, obviously you don't have to take this course. You're most welcome to take this course. Uh, there are other computing courses you can choose. You can choose Comp 1911, which I said before is sort of like a easier version of this in a sense. They sort of go through half of the content that we do. And there's also another course, Eng 1811, that teaches, again, an easier type of programming. So three programming courses to choose from. Take whichever one you think you want to take. And you can switch, I believe there's a couple of weeks. I think the end of week five is the hard deadline for you cannot change courses anymore. It might be earlier than that, but I think that's the absolute hard deadline. So you have a little bit of time to think about if you want to drop down to Comp 1911. Um, but back to the slides. So I found over you know, the years of teaching, there are three different types of students we tend to have in these introductory computing courses. So the first sort of student are the, the red students, I call them. They've been programming forever. They like dream in assembly language. They're very confident. They know what they're doing. The challenge for this course is to unlearn any bad habits that they have, um, learn to think in different ways. Often, students who have self-taught programming or have learned programming but not sort of formally think they're really great at programming because they can do all these things. But just because you can do things doesn't necessarily mean you're doing them right. So for the students who have a lot of programming experience, your challenge is going to be uh, being open to learning more and being careful about, you know, try and be aware of just be, be open to finding out just how much you have to learn. Don't sort of come in and think, oh, I know everything, it's going to be great, I don't need to come to lectures, don't need to learn anything. Because then you'll find at the end of the course, actually, you don't know the things you thought you knew, and then you'll fail, and it will be bad. Then there are the yellow programmers who have a little bit of experience. They're kind of confident. They're feeling like, yeah, OK, I can do this course. It'll be OK. Um, and then there's the green students who've never programmed before. And they're sort of feeling like, I don't know what's going on. Everything's confusing, like what's going on? All these students know what they're doing, and you know, my friend, other people in my tutor know all this stuff, and I don't know all this stuff, and I'm so behind. But you're not alone. It can feel like you are the only person in your class who doesn't know any programming yet, and that's because the people who do know programming are really excited and really loud about it. So how many of you haven't done any programming, or you've done a tiny bit, but not much? 
Yeah, I'd say that's like a third of the course. So you're very much not alone. And by the way, you don't need any programming experience for this course. We teach you everything from like the ground up. Um, one thing I found, many of the best students we've ever had had no programming experience before they started. The student last semester who came first in the course wasn't even a computing student. Like, if you don't know computing yet, that's fine. You can still do well. Like, you are not at any disadvantage. You might find the first week or two you feel like you don't know as much because the other students have more knowledge than you. But after the first like two, three weeks, the difference is completely gone. And you have this head start because you've already started you know, learning and paying attention and working out these things for yourself rather than kind of you know, cruising through a knowledge that you have from the past. So in conclusion, everything is good for everybody. So in terms of the activities in this course, we have the lectures, the things you're at now, which uh, introduce the theory and also the practice of programming. So I'll cover the necessary theory, but a lot of it will be actually writing code, going through code, you know, seeing how all of that process works. We then have tutorials and labs. So you'll find in your timetable, you'll have a one hour tutorial and then below that a two hour lab. Those are all with the same group of people, with the same tutor, but in two different places. So in the tutorial, you discuss things with your tutor and you, you know, go through clarifying any things you don't understand from the lectures, maybe. And then in the labs, you do actual hands-on programming, working on you know, real programming exercises. Those are really fun. They start in week one. If you didn't go to your tutorial because you didn't realize it was on yesterday or this morning, that's OK. The first week is just like introductions. But if you can, definitely go along. Uh, next, we have <clears throat> assignments, which they're a way of sort of working on. Um, pretend that's not written there. I didn't delete that from the slides. The assignments are all individual. I'm sorry. I didn't check this closely enough. So the assignments, they're sort of a way of working on bigger tasks than in the labs. Lab exercises, lab exercises are like these little chunks, like, you know, this thing, this thing, this thing, and you can do them all in a week. And that's really good for practicing skills and you know, building skills and that sort of thing. But it's not very realistic. It's sort of like you know, doing things to practice your skills, but then more realistic things are the assignments are like that. So the assignments are sort of a bigger problem for you to solve. And rather than just being like, you know, this little thing you've got to do, this little thing you've got to do, they sort of take all of the concepts you've learned so far, put everything together to sort of build a, a larger thing. And the assignments are a lot of fun. So. Should be good. Another thing we have that's new this semester are weekly coding tests. So starting in week three, going to week 12, uh, you have like a sort of a one hour test you do like at home on your own computer in your own time. And it's just to make sure that you kind of know what you're doing as you go through. We found with the labs, which are done in pairs, it can be easy to feel like you know more than you do. Like if your partner helps out, you may not realize how much um, and so we give you these so that each week you can sort of see, am I up to date with the content? So it might sound scary. It's not scary. There will be kind of two or three questions each week. Um, if you submit anything at all, even if it doesn't work, you will get like half a mark. If you submit something and it works perfectly, you get one mark. And if you submit something and it sort of works, you get like three quarters of a mark. So it's most important that you do them. And so that you're getting this regular sort of practice to see, can I do this? Am I keeping up to date with the content? And I think it's the best eight of 10 marks. So basically overall, if you do genuinely try, you will do well. It's nothing to sort of freak out about. Um, and finally, the final exam, uh, it'll be three hours during the exam period. It'll show up in your timetable. It'll be super fun. Be done on the lab computers. So you'll be in like an exam environment where you can only access the exam and you can't access your own files and the internet and so on. So that <clears throat> should be good. In terms of the assessments, I'm going to drink some more water. Ah. <clears throat> so that is a, a very good question. I'm going to pretend it was a question. Do we have to write programs out by hand on paper? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Um, no, you don't. At no point in this course do we make you write programs on paper. Um, 
So when I did first year uni at a different university a very long time ago, we had to do our exam on paper. And it's, it's not realistic at all. Like when you're writing code in the real world, you have a text editor. You can sort of delete things, add things as you go. We don't subject you to that. Like we understand that <coughs> programming is a thing that's done on the computer. Cool. But no, we, no writing on paper. For this course, all exams on computers. Even the theory part is on a computer, so you like type into the computer. Um, but there, are there any other questions? Okay, I'm sure you will have more questions soon. There are three assignments. Um, assignment zero is due about week five. It's worth 6%. Should be pretty good. It's sort of, <clears throat> this assignment is designed to not be hard in terms of you have to know lots of programming, but hard in terms of the problem to solve is slightly complex. So the challenge of it is working out how to solve the problem and kind of putting that solution into code rather than actually knowing all this programming stuff. Um, assignment one, it'll be due week nine-ish. Assignment two, it'll be due week 12-ish. That'll all be confirmed and on the course website and stuff as we know. Uh, the weekly coding tests, best eight of 10, worth 8% overall. Lab exercises are done in pairs, and you'll switch pairs three times throughout the semester. So it'll be you and someone else in your class, and then you'll swap, and then you'll swap. Um, they're due every week, worth 12% overall. Um, yeah, they're pretty good. And then the final exam, you can just see under there, is 50%. Cool. <clears throat> so another really important thing, uh, communications, email. How many of you have not got an email from the course so far? We've sent out one or two emails. How many of you don't have that email? Cool, either you're not paying attention, you're not here, or you're all checking your emails, that's great. So it's really important to make sure that you can receive emails from the course. You can check your uni emails. Your tutor can show you how if you don't know already. Maybe you do already know, um, but it's very important. If you set up email forwarding, make sure you test that it works. So if you've set up your email for get your tutor or a friend to email you to make sure it goes to the right place. We always have a few students who set it up for to like an incorrect email address and then they just don't get any emails all semester. It's not great. <clears throat> when you do send emails, and this is really important, send them from your uni email address. Don't send an email from, I don't know, can't think of a silly example. <coughs> I was trying to think of a silly username. Don't send emails from like I like cats at hotmail.com because we don't know who that is, right? And when you do send an email from your uni email address and have your ZID in there, because it's all good to say, you know, hi, Andrew, I am John Smith. There are lots of John, there, there might be lots of John Smiths in the course, and either way, I have to then go look up your ZID, and it's really annoying. So always put your ZID, always send from your uni email address. And try and include your name. Usually useful. We can find out your name, but again, name, ZID, pretty good. Um, to get in touch with the course urgently, you can email what's called the, the course account or the class account, which is cs1511 at cse.unsw.edu.au. This is all on the website. You don't have to write it down. Um, is my lips? Yeah. So. Another place where you can kind of communicate with people and ask questions is the course forum. And so on the course forum, you can ask any questions about the course or about computing or you know, anything that's sort of related to the course. So questions about you know, the lab assignment, things you're confused about, that sort of thing, or questions even, you know, what's great about computer science or how do I set up my computer to do this sort of thing. Any questions at all that are relevant to the course? Uh, there are no stupid answers. There are no stupid questions. Um, there may be stupid answers, but we try to avoid having those. But basically, any question you have, like if you have a question, I'm sure someone else is also wondering that question. You can also post it anonymously if you're concerned about your classmates seeing that you asked a stupid question. Again, there aren't really stupid questions. And also, the lecturers can see who you are from that. So don't post anonymous, anonymously and post like horrible things. Um, but ask any questions there. I'll be reading it. The lecturers will be reading it. The tutors will be reading it. And if you're failing on top of the material, you can answer other people's questions in the forum. Like it's, it's great for that. You can go to the course website and get the link, or it's here if you have a, the lecture slides later on and want to click on it. But 
That leads me to a good point of where is the course website? So most of your other courses at uni will use Moodle. We don't use Moodle because it kind of sucks, and so we've written our own version that's better. The easiest way to get to it, um, I mean, have it in your, like, you know, access it on your computer so that you can just type this and it'll autocorrect. No, okay, it does on my own computer. Once you've used the URL, like, you can go back to it. But if you're trying to find it for now, Google Comp 1511. Um, this is not the right page. This is the handbook. This is the information from the university. This is closer to the right page. This is the course website from last year. Click on this, and eventually it'll be the right one. Change this to be 18 as one. Now you're on the course website. Um, you can also go, there's links in the lecture slides, I think. There's another URL you can use. But if you're confused, just Google. Uh, look for the thing called Web CMS. Make sure you're in 18 as one. Then you're good. So the course forum is linked here. And I will try and log in during the break so I can show you what it's like. You can get to it there. There'll be a link to lecture recordings at some point when it gets put up. There's the FAQ. Course outline is really important to make sure you read. So the thing I found with lectures is that when there are lots of lectures with lots of students, the websites get really slow. So probably you're all on the course website now, and so it's being slow. Um, another tip, hit the view and browser button, and you can read it better. So this is the course outline. It's got all the important stuff. You very definitely should and must read through this in your own time. Cool. Are there any other questions so far? OK. <clears throat> so in terms of sort of developing the course and improving the course, so this is the third time the course has run. It's the, like the second year of it running. So it ran this time last year and then second semester last year. And each time we've tried to improve the course a lot based on the feedback students have given. I guess because <clears throat> it's a relatively new course, because we're very cool and flexible in computer science, we can make big changes to the course like as necessary to make it a better course. So definitely do fill out the surveys at the end of semester that you're given. But during semester, if you have any feedback, if you have any suggestions or concerns or comments, let us know. Um, let me know, let your tutor know, post on the course forum, any of that sort of thing. <clears throat> I am very, very willing to hear feedback on things that could be improved. Like, if you tell me something's a problem and I can fix it, I'll fix it, that sort of thing. So don't feel you have to wait until the end of semester for the survey to say, oh, the lectures are horrible, Andrew's horrible, the projector was broken, and I, if the projector's broken, I can tell them to fix it, right? So. Um, another important thing. <clears throat> One thing in computing, there's sort of this, I don't know, image stereotype of like people in computing, you know, live in their mother's basement and they stay in the dark all day and they drink Mountain Dew and they write code and they have no friends. <clears throat> computing is actually nothing like that. In computing, like, if one person alone can do this much and another person alone can do this much, together they can do way more than twice that. Like, working with other people is very, very powerful. We get you to do it in the labs because it's very, very cool, very useful. But an important part of that, I guess, is, you know, being respectful to each other, being nice to each other. Like, we're all people. We're all humans, right? I assume so. Maybe the tutors aren't. Um, but treat everybody with courtesy and respect. Like, you know, treat people how you want to be treated, or better than that. Um, and yeah, we, this course should be like an inclusive learning environment for everybody. So if you, know, you have problems with the other students in your class, for example, you can talk to your tutor, you can talk to me. Like if people are being mean to you, say something about it. We can, we can fix these things and just be nice to each other. Um, also be aware that not being nice to each other in relation to the things at uni or like on Facebook related to the course is against the student code of conduct and can get you kicked out of the university. I might open Andrew Taylor's slide for that. So the other lecturers have their own different slides, so we cover the exact same stuff but in different ways. But he has a good slide on that or not. Um, I 
think it's course overview. Um, and all these will be on the website, his slides, my slides, the other people's slides. The lecture recordings for all of us will also be on the website so you can see whoever's thing you want to watch the most. This one here. So, oh man, I told him to fix those typos. Typing is hard, okay. But <clears throat> Something to be aware of that you may be unaware of. Obviously, if you do things on campus, like if you're abusive to other people on campus, that is not okay, and you will get kicked out of uni. Like, when you're on campus, the rules apply. It's fairly straightforward. When you are not on campus, if it's related to a course. So for example, if you make a course Facebook group, or like a Facebook group for your people doing a group project or something like that, the university rules still apply. So you might think, oh, it's Facebook, it's totally free. Like, if in anything course related or uni related at all, you are not a nice person, it's against the rules here and we will do something about it. So in general, be nice. We're all great people. I'm sure you're all great people. I'm looking forward to getting to know many of you. Just be nice to each other. And if you do have any problems, talk to me, talk to your tutors and so on. Um, another part of this is plagiarism. So. How many of you have had a lecture for another course so far? Either now or like last year or whatever, most of you. Did they talk about plagiarism heaps and go like, oh, don't plagiarize, it's really bad? No? No? Okay, maybe they've stopped doing that. But often, you know, lecturers put in like, oh, and by the way, plagiarism is bad, don't do it, you know, be a good person, don't do it, into their slides. But it's not like a box ticking thing here. We don't just want to say, okay, look, plagiarism is bad, and now let's teach programming. We do genuinely care about this stuff. Um, and I guess plagiarism comes down to, at any point in time, pretending that somebody else's work is your work is not okay. So things like if we're doing an individual assignment and you take someone else's code, that's not okay. If someone else like writes the code for you, that's not okay. If you work with somebody else when you shouldn't, so like for individual assignment you do the assignment together, that's not okay, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of sort of using other resources, I know in psychology and stuff, if you don't use the right referencing format, you do plagiarism. Um, and here we're not strict about like you must reference using the APA style or anything because we don't know how those work. But it's important that if you do ever use someone else's code like with permission, so for example if you work on something with your lab partner in the lab and you are then allowed to use that in your assignment, just put a comment in your code saying hey I worked on this with my lab partner or you know I got this code from the sample code that the lecturer put up or whatever. Yes. Uh, Yep, so that's a very good question. There's sort of two questions there. Um, can we copy code from Stack Overflow and use that in our code? So Stack Overflow is this website where you ask a question and people answer it, and if you have a problem and you Google it, probably Stack Overflow will have the answer. Can you use code from Stack Overflow in your assignments and stuff? Yes, sort of. Like, when you do an assignment, you have to do the assignment, right? And if you don't do the assignment yourself, you won't get marks for the assignment. So you can't like reference a Stack Overflow post that solves the entire assignment and say, hey, I got this entire solution from Stack Overflow. Like, you won't get any marks, right? Um, if there's like some specific algorithm that you want to use from Stack Overflow, like two or three lines of code or something, check with your tutor at the time because context and stuff matters. But with that sort of thing, it's probably fine to put a comment and say, hey, code from this link. Um, again, like not for key parts of the assignment because we're assessing that you can do the assignment, but for a little unrelated help of things, it's probably fine. Like check with your, your tutor if you don't know, but in general, that sort of thing is fine. And read the course outline. Like I'm not even kidding. Go home tonight and read the course outline and carefully read everything and you know pay attention. Cool. Ah, uh, yes. So the course material. Uh, the slides, the recordings, the labs, and so on are all on the course website, WebCMS. Again, Google for Comp 1511, find the one that's not the handbook, change it to 18S1 if you have to. You'll find everything there. You won't find anything on Moodle. And please read the course outline. So, I guess a question you might want to know the answer to is how do you do well on this course? Um, hopefully, oh. 
maybe to some of you the most important thing is grades and you want to get like a 99 in the course because then your WAM will be really high. Um, and I understand that you know, marks matter to some extent and you might need to have a high enough WAM to get a scholarship or something. But in my opinion, the important thing in the course isn't like the mark you get on paper, but sort of the progress you make as a person. So if you come into this course and you know all the answers, you do nothing all semester, you do the exam, you get 90, like you've achieved nothing. You've got a number on a paper, so what? You've like learned nothing, you've wasted your time. If you come into this course and it's really hard the entire time and you try so hard, you constantly work, and finally in the end you pass the course with like a 52 or something, in my mind you have won. Like, You've battled through the course and you've made it and you've you know, got to the end. So in my opinion, and I understand that grades do matter sometimes in some cases, it's about what you get out of the course. Um, and how to do well in this course, you need to consistently work on programming. So you can't just sort of cram before the final exam, you know, spend the week before the exam or the two days before the exam working really hard, reading all the lecture notes and then pass the exam. Like it doesn't work like that. This isn't a course. Computing programming in general isn't a thing that you can just learn overnight. It's a thing that takes consistent effort, consistent practice across the whole course. It's like learning, you know, to play an instrument or you know, learning the violin. You can't just cram your how to play violin handbook the night before your exam. So if you practice consistently, you work every week on the lab exercises and so on, you will do well. It's important that you prepare for the tutes and labs before you go by looking at the questions before your class. So for the tutorials and labs, you don't have to solve them yourself beforehand. Although if you're on a Friday class, you might want to start working on them before your class. But it's very important you have read through them. So you know what's in the tutorial and you know, oh, this one's kind of hard or I want to ask my tutor what this thing means. So use your time well, basically. Prepare in advance. Um, go to all tutorials and labs. I believe attendance is marked and you have to attend, I want to say at least eight of 12, but the details in the course outline, um, tutes and labs in order to get a sub-exam if you don't do well in the course. So attend all of them. If you miss one because you're sick, that's fine, but make a point of going to all of them. And ask questions. Like, you will be confused a lot of the time and you will be, have things you don't know a lot of the time. Like, that's learning, right? The process of learning involves being confused and not knowing things. Ask questions, ask me questions, ask on the course forum, ask your tutor, ask your lab partner, ask your classmates. We're all happy to answer questions and make the best use of resources that you can. Another thing that will make more sense once we've talked about what compiling is, uh, but there's sort of errors you get when your code doesn't quite look right, I guess. Make a list of all the errors you get and how you fixed it because you will encounter the errors a lot and it's really helpful when you know Oh, I had this last week, and I did this, and then I did this, and it worked. Um, cool, so we have an optional textbook. You do not need to buy the textbook. In most computing courses, you don't need to buy the textbook. There probably are some where you do. But ask the lecturer before buying it. You don't have to buy the textbook. If you want to buy the textbook, it's like a different perspective on things. It's being taught by someone else effectively. It might be a useful resource. You don't have to get it. I believe you can also read it in the library to see if you want to get it in advance. But in computing, like things move so fast. Like a textbook is sort of a thing that's fixed at a set point in time, and once it's published, that's it. The textbook doesn't change. But computing moves fast, and so often you'll find the best answers by like googling things. You know, Google, what does this error message mean, or whatever. And SegOverflow answers again will have a lot of the answers that you need. Getting help. I've said this already. Course forum, definitely go there ask questions, look for other answers first. If someone else has already asked the same question, then you can just get the answer from that. Talk to your peers, talk to your tutor, talk to me. Um, should we have a break now? Probably time for a break. Cool. Um, so before we have a break, some CSE SOC people, is that right, you're gonna talk now? Cool. So. Some people from the Computing Student Society, CSE SOC, are going to talk to you about the cool things that CSE SOC are. Do you have anything you want to put up here? Or? Do you want to put anything up here? Yeah, could you want to go to a browser and open up the Either with that or you can talk to them. Oh, that's 
that's so cool. Is it me? Is it Don't Lie Slush CSC? CSC dash lecture dash back. Please don't look like Schmitz Studios. I won't, I won't. Because they're probably like our students too. Oh, cool. Okay, so before you run off, if you could shh, before you run off, we have a few minutes for these people or less that. Uh, the microphone. So hey everyone, I'm Ali and this is Mark and we mostly do social things for CSE SOC, but it's a lot more than that. Where's your ah um, so yeah, what is CSE SOC? Um, you guys are already all members of CSE SOC just by doing a computer degree or doing a course in computer science. Um, we do social uh, events career opportunities and run workshops, basically just to help you guys um, make new friends and um, be employable. Yeah, so we run tons of events each year um, based on like three main uh, components, three main pillars. We've got our um, like careers sort of side of it, our professional development, which will help you get internships and um, really just know where you want to go in your degree and that sort of stuff. Um, which kind of ties in with our education pillar, which is um, it'll help you get through your course. We're always here to help at all our events. Like we all do CSE too. So, um, and the last thing is socials, which um, is actually where we're from. We're both part of the social team. So, uh, we have lots of sponsors because they really like people like you guys. You're really smart, um, and Bennett will make you even smarter because he's an amazing lecturer. Um, yeah, so all these companies, they're like really cool and they sponsor us because they're interested in people like you. Um, okay, so we have some really amazing uh, events coming up. One of our most uh, important ones is first year camp. So all of you, or most of you are in first year, or at least you're studying a first year CSE course, this one. So what, it, uh, like what first year camp is, is it's like a three day getaway where we'll take care of like accommodation, food, uh, we'll have a party, we'll have events and um, like all sorts of activities over the course of three days at the end of week three. That's the 16th to 18th of March. And um, yeah, uh, we're already half sold out and we've already got um, fully, fully like, everyone, we've reached our maximum signups, but 60 people have paid out of 120. So if you signed up, make sure you pay. If you haven't signed up, just get in, in front of them by paying. Um, yeah, do you want to speak about it? All oh, right, so yeah, our first big event is the meet and greet, which is on this Thursday. So that's everyone that does a uh, uh, computer science course, and that will be in case seven. Yeah, that'll be in the seminar room. Seminar room. In case seven. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is an awesome, handy first year guide just for you guys. Um, it basically contains everything that um, our uh, past students have like wished they knew in first year and we've just compiled it into uh, one place that you can look for um, information, opportunities and all of our events as well. Awesome, so everything we just told you is on our Facebook page and group. So uh, this is like a really great uh, place to find out everything that's happening in the, like, in the school. So everyone whip out your phones or your computers and like our page please um, if you're interested in coming to our events and we'll make sure that we post everything and you know what's happening so feel free to just um, search up CSE SOC UNSW and you'll find our stuff so this over here yes yeah, so these are some of our upcoming events uh, first year camp like Mark mentioned um, the meeting grade on Thursday and the CSE SOC barbecue which is um, on tomorrow. every Wednesday. Yeah, it's every Wednesday. Free lunch. Um, okay, yeah, so mentoring. So I coordinate the peer mentoring program, and you might be wondering what that is. Well, um, a, a lot of us find it quite tough, especially come, if you come from high school, um, it had a transition into university and a computer science degree, especially if you haven't studied uh, computing before. So if you sign up for peer mentoring, we'll match you with an experienced student and you'll get to meet other first years 
and um, I like other computer science students in other years and we have a lot of fun, we do events and um, mentoring is just sort of a place that you can go to to ask questions and like get support because everyone's been in your shoes at some point before. Oh yeah, we have the first event for peer mentoring which is the scavenger hunt and welcome party this Friday. Um, so yeah, quickly sign up for mentoring because applications will probably close tomorrow. Okay, well, so now applications will open for our um, teams where you can like join the social team, help us out, organize events and run things. We'll make sure that like we run events just for you guys because you're helping us. So, of course, we want to like reward you for your awesome work. Um, so just keep an eye out on that. Everything will be on our Facebook. And yeah, that's it. Hope to see you guys at all our events. Bye. Yeah. Three, two, one. Sorry, the beeping is very loud. So, welcome back. Hello again, everybody. Uh, I have a cool thing to show you, which I load now if I can. Yeah. So that's there we go. Um so one of the things I did last semester at the end of the course was I Got all the students to kind of fill out a thing saying, you know, what was the best part of the course, what was the worst part. Is this loud enough? It feels quieter than before. Is that better? People at the back, can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Cool. Um, so I got students to say what was the best part, what was the worst part, uh, what was hardest, what was the most fun. And if you did this semester again, what would you do differently this time? Is that a question or? Um, and I made a word cloud because word clouds are really cool and so it's got like all of the words by the, you know, popularity frequency. Um, some things that really came through, um, start earlier. I think if you asked anybody at all at university their advice about an assignment, they would say start earlier because people always put it off and think, oh, you know, I can do it, it'll be easy, I'll do it in the last day, and then they can't do it, and then it's bad. So always start things earlier. I think time was like, you know, do things on time. Practice is a very big one. Um, you know, programming, questions, assignment, understand everything. But I thought this was pretty cool. So I think overall, Start better lab work time earlier try course. Words of wisdom from previous students. So back to the slides. Before we get started, are there any questions about anything? Yes. Um, very good question. Do we need to download any kind of software? Sort of yes. Remind me in a couple of minutes when I do a thing that's related to that, and I'll talk about it more. Very good question. Any other questions? Okay, so in terms of getting started this week, the things, hang on, let me do this. There we go. Um, the things that you should have done by the end of this week are finish the first lab. So in your lab class, you'll start and possibly also finish it this week. But make sure that's done before the end of the week. You should be able to write a Hello World program. You know what that means in a moment. From your CSE account at uni and from your home computer. So one of the things that your tutor can help you with uh, in the tut lab this week and on the course forums, you can ask questions and so on 
is how to get things set up on your own computer so that you can write programs yourself from home. Um, so how many of you have had your tute slash lab already? They're all sitting in that corner. Are you all in the same class? No? Just a coincidence? So a handful of you. Um, you will have already seen the CSE lab computers. They're a bit different to kind of normal computers, I guess. The library computers they have at uni and the other computers that you can use in other places are running Windows, and you might have Mac laptops. I see quite a lot of them scattered around the place. But the CSE lab computers run something called Linux, which is a different operating system, like how Windows and Mac are operating systems. Linux is just a different one again. Uh, it's very different, but you will soon learn to use it, and you'll you know, be a pro at using it. The easiest way to use these, if you're in a lab, you can use the lab computer. If you're not in the lab, you can use VLab, which is a really, really amazing thing. And it's really cool. And it's new as of last semester, and so I haven't quite gotten over how much I love it. It's so cool. You can basically log into a lab computer from your own computer. And same layout, same everything. It's fantastic. Um, you should log in with your ZID and ZPass, the same as the lab computers. If you don't have a ZID or a ZPass, so the ZID is the one on your student card. Um, if you don't have a student card yet, you should probably go enroll. Um, important thing to do. And if you don't know your password, make sure you set it before the class if you can. If you can't work out what it is, your tutor can help you reset it. Um, so I might start out by showing you how to do this. So there was a question earlier, do we have to install any software on our computers? If you want to access this VLab thing to use the lab machines from home, you'll need to install what's called a VNC viewer. Um, there are instructions for this on the course website, and I'll show you so that you don't think you have to write them down. Um, course website, home computing, then instructions for VLab. So you can click on this link, read all the instructions. It's all there. So don't worry about writing down what I'm doing. It's all written down. Don't panic. Everything is good. So you run what's called a VNC viewer. It'll pop up and ask you for the server. You type in the server. It's, again, all on the page. You hit connect. And then, eventually, you get a login screen. Um, what's the, is it F8 to do full screen? Cool. And so here's a login screen. A login with your ZID. Um, in my case, I have a username rather than a ZID. And your Z pass. You'll get this thing. So it starts out by saying uh, this is a CSE computer. If you use it without permission, it's illegal. Don't be illegal. Like, don't use someone else's account. Like, don't steal their password. Don't delete their assignments. It's just a mean thing to do. You can just ignore this one. And then you get, you don't get that one. You get something that looks like this. And so similar to Windows and Mac, you can, you know, icons you can drag around. Um, and so this is what you'll also see when you open a lab computer. It'll... Yes, ah, good point. So if you haven't logged in before, you'll get a pop-up that says something like, do you know what the wording is? Yeah, OK. Like, basically, this is the first time you've logged in. What do you want to do? The middle option is something like default settings. You want to press that button. If you don't press that button and you don't have this thing down the bottom show up, your tutor can help you fix it. But if it asks you, do that. So I will very briefly jump back to the slides. So. Um, when we write programs, we write them in what's called a text editor. So it's a way of editing text. Um, if you have something like you know, Microsoft Word or Pages is the Mac one or whatever you have, when you save a file in that, it's got formatting attached. So like this is bold text, this is underlined, this is this color and font, and so on. If you tried to kind of run that with the computer, the computer would be like, hang on, what? This doesn't make sense. This isn't code. So. It's important that we write, uh, write our programs in just plain text in a text editor. The language that we're going to be learning is called C. And it has sort of well-defined rules for how the language works. So we can describe something 
that says how our program should work, and then turn that into code that the computer can understand. So we write our code in C, which is written for humans to read, but in a way that the computer can understand. And then using a thing called a compiler, we turn that into a program that the computer can run and humans can't really understand. Let's try it. Cool, so one of the things, ignore what I'm doing for a second. Cool, let's pretend I push this button down here. That one just has a really small font, this one has big font. So you push this button here, and this thing pops up called a terminal, um, and I'm gonna use the bigger one. And so, how many of you have used a terminal before, like the command line? Okay, quite a few, maybe like a quarter. So, in the terminal, in the command line, we sort of use them interchangeably. You can do just about anything you can do with a graphical program, but it's a lot more powerful because you don't have to you know, push buttons to navigate through things. So, for example, if I use the file browser and I go to like my home folder, which is sort of like my documents in Windows, and then I go to like my HTML folder, and then I go to like my slides folder, and then this is all the stuff from this week's slides. Um, I can do the same thing in here um, by using the change directory command. Directories are like folders, it's just another name for the same thing. So I can see that I went to public HTML slides, so cd public HTML slash slides. And I can see the files in here are the same as those files there. And this one was just like typing two words and this one was clicking a whole bunch of mouse things. So you can do basically anything with one you can do with the other. Terminals are just faster and more convenient once you know how to do things. So let's start out by looking at a few commands. CD stands for change directory, so you can change like the folder that you're currently in, the folder you're looking at. Um, I've gone CD squiggle, I think it's called tilde, it's the one shift the thing to the left of the one, and that will take you to your home folder. Inside here, I can type ls, which is, sounds for like list something, like show the files. And this will show the files and folders that I have inside my home directory. So I've got a folder called desktop, a folder called bin, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, and so on. I can then cd into my cs1511 folder. Look at the things in here. I have a file I made earlier. I can make a folder with make dir, make directory, um, lecture one and then I'll go into lecture one. Um, a cool thing I'm doing, I'm hitting the tab key on my keyboard and it's just completing the rest of it for me. It saves a lot of typing and you can do that. Okay, and I can see no files in this folder. So I'm in a folder from my home directory, I'm in a folder called CS1511, then I'm in a folder called lecture one. So does that all sort of make sense so far? And I typed clear, which cleared the screen. Um, who's feeling sort of confused and like what, I don't remember that, how do I memorize those? A few people are being honest, very good. You don't have to memorize this right now. With practice, you will soon know how to do all of this stuff yourself and it'll be really easy. For now, don't panic. So, like I said before, we write programs in a text editor. The one that we use is called gedit. Um, so I can type gedit, I can type a command, hit enter, it'll open the program for me. And so this is the thing called gedit. It says I'm working in a thing called unsaved document one, like you know when you open notepad or whatever, it's a default blank thing. So, I'll write some stuff, hello. I'll save, you can do control S or the save button. Um, I'll call it hello. And so now if I go back to my terminal and I type ls, it doesn't do anything. Any idea what's going on? Like, why can't I type ls now? Uh, yeah, gedit's still running. Exactly, so because gedit is open from the terminal, I can't use the terminal. So what I can do instead is run gedit in the background with the ampersand, which is shift seven. Um, and so I'll open my hello again. But you can see I can still use my terminal now, so it's still working, so that's cool. Um, another useful command is cat, nothing to do with the animal. It'll show you what's in a file. So cat hello, 
inside my file called hello, it says hello. Right, could I make a new file on the desktop? Yes, that is a thing you can do. Um, so I went CS1511 and then like new folders, just like Windows or Mac. No, so I didn't have to use a terminal for that, but I used the terminal because it's faster, in my opinion. It will be faster for you too once you are a pro at the terminal. Um, another thing I did cd space dot dot is go like back a directory, so upper directory. So you can see I was in lecture one, and now I've gone back to the one that was above it, CS1511. I'll go back into lecture one. Um, I already have gedit running over here. So I'll make a new file. I'm going to write some code in it. So I'll start out by giving it a name. We call our program something .c because it's a C file with C code in it. And so I'm going to write out like sort of the classic first program that you write in any language, which is called hello world. So I want to write a program that in some code will print to the terminal like the words hello world. And so there are several sort of, I guess, core components to a program we write. And again, this is all in the slides. Pay attention. You can get the recording later on. You can see it all. Like, don't panic if you can't follow, but follow if you can. So we start out with a comment. And a comment is something that the computer doesn't see, but the humans do see. And since we're writing out C code for humans to read, it's important to have good comments. So I start out with a sort of description of what I'm doing. Uh, Thanks, the classic hello world message. So that's what my program's doing. I'll say my name. If I can spell my own name. And I'll have the date, so it's 27. Cool, and so I've done the start of my program. I've written a comment saying what it's going to do. I've put my name and the date, so important first step. Um, there are sort of a couple of things you just have to memorize for now that you will soon understand why we do them. And I'm really sorry about this, because I remember in high school, like the teacher would say, oh, you don't need to know that it's not on the exam, or oh, we'll teach you that next year. I feel your frustration, but for now, memorize these things, and then soon, we'll know what they mean. So the first thing we have to do is called a hash include, which is like saying use someone else's code to do this thing. Uh, in this case, a thing called stereotyped. You see it magically gained colors when I finished typing it because it knew this is like a piece of C code that it understands now. So this means include the code for the standard input and output. So things like printing to the terminal. Um, cool. And then I have a thing called a main function. And this means the main function is the thing that happens when your program runs. So when your program runs, it'll go into this main function, it'll do whatever's in that, and then it'll exit. Um, a function is just a thing that sort of takes input and gives output. So like in math, you've got cos and sine. You give it a number, and it gives you a different number. But in this case, it's not really giving us anything useful. It's just the, the container where our code happens. Cool. So you'll notice I have the open and close curly brackets. We do this to sort of tell the computer, hey, the code is happening inside this thing. And then once we have a curly bracket, we indent everything across by four spaces by hitting the tab key. And your tutor can show you how to configure that, or I've got a script that'll help you configure it. So you hit the tab key, it indents it across one. Um, we do a thing called printf, which means print formatted. What does that mean? Who knows? Hello, world. And so it's going to print out whatever is inside this. So if it says, hello world, print means like display in the terminal, not print to a printer. It took me quite a long time to realize that when I was learning, and I felt really embarrassed. So when we say print, we mean like display in the terminal. So printf, hello world. Um, and then finally, the last line that we always have in our programs or in our main function is returns error. Cool. So I've written myself some C code. It's going to print out hello world. Oh, what just happened? There we go. So now I will run it in the terminal. 
just trying to make it fit there. Cool, so we can see we've now got a file called hello.c. Um, so I had this file hello from before that just said hello. I'm going to delete that. Um, RM stands for remove. Now it's gone. So like I said before, we write the C code for the humans, but in a language that the computer can sort of turn into computer code. We use a thing called a compiler to turn it into computer code. And so the compiler we use is called DCC. Can you see that, by the way, people at the back, the bottom of the screen is readable? Yep, cool. Um, so the compiler is called DCC. It's, I don't actually know what the D stands for. The DC compiler, D something C compiler. Um, we give it dash O, like the letter O, lowercase. Then the name we want to call the program. So in this case, we're going to call it hello. And then we give it the source code, hello.c. And so what this has done is it's taken our program, our code, our source code, hello.c, and it's given us a program we can run called hello. You can see in my terminal it's sort of bright green because the, the terminal knows that it's a program we can run rather than like a file it can look at. And so I can type dot slash hello. Dot slash means run something in this current directory. And then hello is the name of it. Hello world. Um, you'll notice this is now like on the same line as my terminal, so it's kind of squished in, which isn't super great. This has happened because we haven't told it to like print out a thing that says go to the next line with your next command. So you can see if I run this again, like it's always the terminal squished next to it. So what I can do is add a thing called a new line to my code. So backslash n. And what this means, uh, anything with a backslash is like a special character. And so backslash followed by something will do some sort of character we can't print out or we can't type in by ourselves. By the way, when I say character, I mean like a letter, for example, or a number or a digit or something. So like h is a character, comma is a character, space is a character, and so on. If I ever use words and you don't know what they mean, please just like wave and ask questions because, you know. So the backslash n together is a character we can't print. And this time it's a new line because if I tried to put a new line like an enter in my code, it would end up looking like that. And so now it's like broken source code because the computer is going to go, OK, hello world. And then the, end, the line doesn't end properly. And then this weird thing is here. Let's try it and see. Um, so I'll run the compiler again, dcc o hello, hello.c. Welcome to your very first compiler error message. You'll be seeing a lot of these in your life. So one thing with error messages on computers, they're confusing. Um, even when they try and make them not be confusing, they're still confusing. Often with things like this, it's sort of a matter of knowing which things are the important things and which things are sort of irrelevant or which things you can ignore, or like what's the most important thing. So here, for example, we have uh, one, two warnings and two errors and then a note. So look at this first warning, missing, terminating, quote mark, double speech mark, quote mark, character, dash W invalid PP token. What does that mean? Who knows? Is it important? Not really. But the useful bit is here where it's saying, hey, we've got this line printf speech mark hello world. And this thing here is where the problem is. And so it's saying there isn't one that sort of matches it. Um, we have another line here, error expected expression um, on line 8, character 12. Same place. Um, what does that mean? Who knows? Something is wrong. Um, missing terminating character, quote character again, on this line down here. And then error expected the close Google bracket to match this one here. So I mean, we've got a closing one there, right? But because our code is so broken, the computer can't work out how to get to that end one. Um, and so again, this is sort of confusing and doesn't really make all that much sense. You can sort of work out from the fact that it says we're missing like a terminating speech mark that we've forgotten to put a closed speech mark on the same line. So I'll put that there. Um, maybe I'll just fix that one and then see what else breaks. 
Um, so you can see, oh, I'll delete that one because we know that one's wrong. Um, I've put in the missing speech mark. But now if I run it again, it says error expected close circle bracket um, on the line return zero. Often when it says you've got an error on this line, the, li the error will be on the line above. So in this case, it's saying there's an error on the line return zero, but actually the error is on the printf line. It can't really know until it's hit this thing and knows something's wrong that it was the one above. And it's saying, um, note to match this open circle bracket, which is that one there. So it's saying, hey, we need a closing circle bracket to close it. And you can see it's sort of highlighted it saying those now match. Compile again. By the way, you can push the up arrow key to get to the previous commands you've run. Saves a lot of typing as well. So now, another error message. Error expected semicolon after expression. Explanation, try including a semicolon at the end of line eight of hello.c. You can do that, end of line eight, semicolon, save. Uh, with semicolons, we always have them at the end of lines of code that are sort of doing things, sort of like a complete thing by itself. So like in the case of int main here, we wouldn't have a semicolon here, because that's like not the end of it, like that's not the end of the main function, for example. But on this line here is the, is the end of the printf, so we have a semicolon there. And so now if we run it this time, it compiled. Um, so how do I run programs again now that I've compiled it? Dot slash. Hello. Cool, it's printed at hello world. Oh, but without, still doesn't go to the next line. So we'll put in a new line, compile it again, just the up arrow key to get to the previous thing, run it again, hello world. Look at that on the line by itself. Cool, okay, what questions do you have so far? Yes. Ah, why do these lines need to be empty? Or why are they empty? The answer is, um, white space doesn't matter to the compiler. So the thing that turns the C code into the computer program that it can run doesn't care about white space. So things like spaces and new lines. Um, I could make this be like this and do like this. Um, and I could like have all these lines here. The program will still work because it sort of ignores all this when it runs the program or when it tries to compile the program. And just to prove that, I will compile it and see. So it's still compiled, it still runs. But is this easy to understand now or is this just like confusing and ugly? Yeah? It's a very good question. Hold that thought, I'll just make my code look nice. Um, and so when we use white space, we use it for the purpose of the people reading the code. So I'll delete that there, I'll delete that there. Cool, and so in this case, it's more readable in my opinion to sort of have the main, a blank line, thing that's happening, blank line, return. You could write it squished up like this as well. That's also gonna work. Um, what does the int mean in this line with the main? Very good question. Uh, functions, like I said before, like they have to return something, they have to give an output. So like the cos or sine or tan functions, you give them a number and they give you out a different number. In this case, the main function expects, the thing that calls the main function expects to get a number back. Um, that number tells it basically whether the program has worked. So returning zero means program worked, all good. Returning a number other than zero means like it's broken with error number 42, for example. Um, this makes no difference to you when you're running it like as far as you can tell. It still runs just fine. But if your program was being called by another program, it could then know, oh, I've had error 42, don't keep on going. And so that in there means this returns an integer. Um, an integer is a number, and in, that case, in this case, the number is 42. Cool, good question. Any other questions? Sorry, could you say that again? Right, so if I heard your question, didn't I write it myself so the, like it doesn't change based on if something's broken, is that what you mean? <coughs> so 
so if I've understood your question correctly, I think you're saying, you know, I've said that if I return 42, that means there was a problem of some kind. Zero means it worked, but I have to change that myself. So like the program doesn't change it as it goes. Is that what you're saying? Yep. And so the answer to that is, oh, ha, ha, I just wait until week two. Um, Programs are kind of boring if they just do like one thing. Like this program, right? This program can only ever do one thing. It calls the main function, prints out hello world, it returns zero. Like no matter what code I write in here, like I can tell it to print hello world lots of times. Right? Cool, look at that, exciting. But it'll still only do this. Like it'll print this, it'll print this, it'll print this, da -da -da -da, it returns zero. Like every time it will do the exact same thing. Later on, we'll talk about things called conditionals, which is like a way of saying, you know, if we're in this situation, then do this thing. Otherwise, if we're in this situation, do this thing. And so once we've got that, we can sort of have, you know, like if we're in this situation, um, this is not the right syntax, by the way, just to sort of illustrate, then, you know, do something if we're in this other situation. Then we might say like there's an error, so you know return 42, for example. So this is the sort of structure we'll learn later on next week of, you know, if some situation happens, do this, and if another situation happens, do this. And so in this case, we'd have like the different return values. Does that answer your question? Cool. Um, uh, the question, yes. Another very good question. I see you've got lots of good questions to ask. Um, so void, what does the word void mean in general? Yeah, nothing empty like the you know, dark bottomless void of an infinite cave or something. It just means empty or nothing. Um, we're telling it that it's taking no input and we're just explicitly saying void so that it knows we intentionally want it to take no input. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. Other questions? How do you get it to go four spaces out? So that is a very good question. The answer is about half an hour after the lecture is finished, I'll have written a script that you can run that'll fix it all for you. Um, I had the idea before the lecture, I worked out how to do it, but then I had to come and teach a lecture. Like, come on, gosh, you guys getting in the way of me writing scripts. Um, so I'll write a thing that you can just run it in the terminal and it'll fix it all for you. But for now, what happens? I hit the tab key, like the one above caps lock. And the editor is set up such that it would then put four spaces in. So you can see one, two, three, four. If you want to configure it yourself, you can go to edit preferences. You basically want to like tick all of the buttons, then under editor, uh, four, and then space instead of tabs. Again, basically like tick every single box, tick those ones, and then stop ticking boxes. But I'll write a thing to do it after the lecture. Cool. Did that answer your question, mysterious person up the back? Cool. Yes. Um, in the terminal, what's um, yep. the difference between the compiler line and the Cool. Very good question. So in the terminal, what's the difference between the compiler line and the dot slash? I'm going to live really dangerously and try and turn the document camera on. Um, hey, friendly tutors, could you help me? This is a lot easier to explain with a diagram. And if I can easily do a diagram, then I'll do a diagram. Yep. Okay, does this work? Maybe. Yes. Cool. Um, and so the sort of process of coding, you have, I apologize for my handwriting. Is that readable? So you like write code. So that's like eg hello.c. And so then the code that you've written goes into the compiler. So that's eg dcc o hello. Let's see, I just took it on that line there. 
and then that run code eg dot slash hello. Cool. Is that readable? So there's sort of the three steps. We we write the code, so we have ng edit, we write the hello file, we put the C code inside. We then run the compiler, so there's DCC line here, and this will go from, this will take in our source code file and give us out a compiled program, like a program that the computer can understand directly. Um, and then once we have that program made, we can run it with a dot slash. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Cool, very good question. Why do we need this hello twice? So I might switch back to the computer. Actually, I won't do that yet. So I'll write it out again in full. So there's sort of like several components here. One of them is the DCC. We're running the program DCC in the terminal. And we're giving it some things that are called arguments. So we're saying, hey, DCC, here are some things to make you do what I want you to do. Um, and there are two of them here. The first one is the dash o hello. That's all one thing. And then the next one is the hello.c. Um, and you can swap the order of these. So you could go DCC hello.c dash o hello. But the, that's got to be together. That's got to be together. So the reason we've got the dash o hello and the hello.c is we're telling it, make my program be called hello using the source code hello.c. Good question. Does that answer your question? Cool. Which thing did I just say that you want me to repeat? That's not a very useful question. Yes, I will jump to the computer and show you. So I can call it whatever I want. I will just clear this away. So DCC, dash o anything. What should I call the program? No one has any ideas at all of anything. That's a very long name for a program. Note that I'm not putting any spaces in, because spaces in the terminal get interesting. Like, we sort of have spaces here to separate the different things. And so if I have spaces in my name of my thing, it'll get confused. I'm going to make it more readable. That's a very long name for a program. Cool. And so the program that I compiled, the compiled version is going to be called. That's a very long name for a program. And the input file will be hello.c. Cool. And now if I list the files, I can see about a program. Cool. That's a very long name for a program. And I'll run that. Puts out hello world six times. Cool. Good question. Yep. That one. Um, the question he asked, what kernel are you running? It's sort of hard to explain in the context of like Windows and Mac because they're very much one thing. In Linux, there's a thing called the kernel, which is like the core part of the operating system that does, you know, talks to the hardware directly. And then there's sort of the larger part, which is all the programs and stuff that run. Um, and the kernel can be different versions. Um, the long answer to your question is talk to Jishank, the guy up the front, later on, because he has very strong opinions about kernels and the CSE kernels and the CSE environment. But the long answer is try it and see. Not yes, that's another one. The, the other long answer is try it and see, because it's not consistent across computers. Cool. Any other questions? So I said before that when we compile it with DCC, the compiler, it turns it from C code we understand to code the computer understands, right? So to prove this to you, remember the cat command from before? I can type cache, hello.c, and that's my source code. This is the thing that humans can read, humans can understand, all good. What do you think I'll get if I cat hello, for example, with a program? Someone said lots of numbers. Yeah, any other thoughts? What's going to happen? Assembly language. Assembly language, yeah. 
Any other thoughts? What, what, what am I going to see on the screen? Jumble of letters and numbers? Yeah, let's, let's try. I look at beeps as well. That's nice. Thanks, computer. Um, so we can see... Oh, there's way too much of it. See how it was white before and now it's gray? One of the characters in the code, I think, just so happened to be the one that says make it gray, printed out gray. Yep, the shooters at the front are nodding. Um, so last year when I, when I did this, it crashed the computer. Like, coincidentally and unrelated to that, the internet dropped out or something, which is beautiful. Um, I'm a little bit glad that didn't happen this time. But you can see there's all of these random words in here. Lots and lots and lots of words. There's some weird characters we had up the front here. The boxes are like unprintable characters, so put them in a box for you. Let's do that again. So there's another useful command called, is it all going to be in one line? Called head. And that'll show you like the, the head of the program, the top of the program. Um, and I'm going to say give me 100 lines. 10 beeps. That was satisfying. Um, and so we can see in this random stuff, um, some of it maybe makes sense. Right, that's where we started out here. We can see there's like some words that make sense in here, maybe there's some random stuff. There's like almost the whole alphabet for some reason, and then different part of the alphabet. Who knows? Um, can anybody?